Uh, thank you, and hello, everyone. Um, your profession is problematic, and your careers are problematic. And what I mean by that is you're facing, and the Navy and the institution you're in is facing problems, as all institutions do. And one reason for that is the unpredictable, uncertain state of the world that's already been referred to uh, on several occasions uh, this afternoon. And that faces us with an issue. We have long life platforms um, and an unpredictable future. How to cope with that? While you try and get your predictions as good as possible, you try and think about what kind of future uh, you should be preparing for. But that's an extremely difficult thing to do. There are two types of future. The first is the no surprise future, based on working out trends, what has happened, projecting forwards, and planning accordingly. It all sounds awfully neat, awfully controllable. And it, looking at things like the pattern of demography, where people live, what the trends are, what the populations are going to be. You can do the same sort of thing with economic power. You work out the future economic shape of the world uh, on the basis of past trends and long experience. And you put the sort of two things together and you start to work out patterns of economic activity, the linkages between this and the strategic weight of various areas, including your own, of course. And, you know, it's sort of almost a commonplace these days to say that uh, the Indo-Pacific region is going to get more and more important. Therefore, your careers are going to be in an area that's more and more important and clearly maritime in almost every perspective. So you're right, if you like, at the cutting edge of uh, your nation's involvement in all of these affairs. But, of course, it's all constrained by resources, budgets, we've heard a lot about that over the last three days or so, um, but also environmental stress, global warming, what the impact of that will be, um, 2030s, 2040s, 2050s, uh, your lifetime, your career time. And then, of course, there's the impact of new technology. Um, you're much better placed to think about this than any of us, actually, up on the, on, on the stage. Um, What's it going to do? What's it going to mean? Uh, is it going to radically transform things, or is it all just uh, different ways of doing the same sort of thing? Well, obviously, um, there are trends, uh, there are problems with every aspect of trend analysis. It's actually much more difficult than it looks. First of all, there are problems of measurement. You know, how do you actually assess global warming? It's still a controversy, even though. Um, most of the uh, environmental scientists of the world um, have studied the subject. They are far from uh, united in their views of what it is, what's causing it, what its consequences will be, and how soon it will happen. Uh, if you look at, you know, Japan's economic rise, rise oh, since the Second World War, um, people were talking about Japan as an economic superpower in a real sense of the word in the 1990s. And what do we have? we had stagnation. So, with the best will in the world, the data is ambiguous, shall we say. And it means that you cope, have to cope with the fact that things change. Um, it, and it partly depends on, on how far back you go in order to go and project forwards. Because if you go back over the last 10 years, for example, you get a very different image of the future of the world economy than if you go back 20 years and project that straight line forwards. So there are all sorts of snags and difficulties there. And then, of course, there are the totally unexpected events, the totally unassumed, unplanned, unpredictable things that just happen, um, whatever they are. And that gets us, of course, into the other kind of future, uh, the surprise future. I'm sure you all know that Adolf Hitler served in the German infantry in the First World War. In 1917, uh, he was uh, nearly hit in the neck by uh, a, a bullet that actually grazed his skin. And just think what difference uh, if, it, if it would have made to the world if that bullet had been two inches to the left. Would there have been a Second World War? 
Will Germany follow the path, path that it did? Or, or perhaps it doesn't. It depends on how important you think the, the great men of history actually are. But either way, the completely unexpected event uh, can radically uh, transform things. They simply can't be predicted. Um, sometimes the result of this comes about that they're simple, unexpected things that people do. Look at this, for example. Um, the Iraqis in the desert storm had a problem with protecting their aircraft. So they came up with the idea of burying them. Not the sort of thing that would occur in most RAF staff, uh, Air Force staff colleges, I would suggest. Um, but it was effective. Um, it sort of explained where some of those aircraft had disappeared to. And uh, the Allies were really quite pleased when they kind of pulled them out afterwards and found what they'd got. Sometimes it's the unexpected combination of things, and I'm not sure if this is sort of culturally exportable. It makes sense in the UK. I'm not sure if it will here. Uh, Peter Rabbit Tankiller, a combination of Beatrix Potter, um, the Taylor Squirrel Nutkin, and Sven Hassel, um, SS Death Bastards Regiment. You, you get the idea. These, these are sort of events that happen at the same time. They don't, you just don't think they will. Um, but they do. And, and one sort of obvious manifestation of that is this whole concept of hybrid warfare that's now so fashionable. Um, not fashionable, but so common, where you might end up as a military fighting um, a high-intensity operation at the same place in the same time as you're conducting a stability operation or engaging in humanitarian expeditions of one sort or another. Now, these are the sorts of things that are simply not talked about because they just hadn't occurred before. Uh, they really hadn't. So either way, um, we end up with a kind of uncertain future and it's sort of vaguely ominous, a bit like um, the crew of that uh, uh, merchant ship uh, going into. So how do, how do you cope if you're a planner? And by that I include people who are planning their own careers, i.e. you lot. Um, what to expect if you're the person being planned well, the solutions that I've sort of come up with just to sort of whet your appetite and, and get you going really are, are not really very novel. Um, obviously, seeking balance in the sense of planning for what you can predict and planning for what you can't predict. Um, and one answer, of course, is the famous golf bag idea that each country, each one of you, uh, develops uh, not just a single capability, but a range of capabilities that mean that you can cope uh, when things change, as they certainly will. Um, this is connected, obviously, to what I would call the capacity to innovate and to adapt. And this is really related to personal and institutional agility. Being able to develop um, new ideas, radical new ideas that sort of come out of the blue. I expect you've been following the debate about maritime domain awareness that's going on almost everywhere at the moment, uh, with some people saying, let's go back to airships, or aerostats as they're called, you know, at long last, uh, this is the answer to our problem. So that radical thought is going backwards. Another radical thought is actually saying, do we really need MPAs these days? Can't you just have U UAVs controlled by iPads? You know, what fun that would be. And so much cheaper, et cetera, et cetera. It all means sort of developing ideas, if you like, being radical, thinking uh, outside the box. And this obviously is related to my last point, really. And that's independent and critical thought. And my colleagues here have made the point that the Navy, any Navy, any large organization, and the individual are the same thing, actually. Um, and it's, this is something that applies to both. Uh, the Navy, any Navy, needs to be capable of critical thought, and you need to be capable of critical thought contributing to it. Now, obviously, one way of doing it is to you know, think about things and then come up with some kind of solution, like those two. Now, I know, and I've done it deliberately, that those are the old versions. Um, and that's the point. You actually have to uh, constantly renew it, constantly do it. I've deliberately shown uh, the old versions of those two sets of 
maritime strategies because you really do have to keep renewing it. There is no final answer to anything. If you think you've found the final answer, the bad guys will change the question. That's the logic of things. That's why everything to do with the military um, is actually dynamic. It's a kind of duel between you and the environment and maybe in some cases your adversary. And we all know what the principle of doing that is. It's that you come up with your ideas, you educate your people, uh, you try it out in operations, you see how it responds to the context, you then work out how well it's done, and then you change it. And it's a kind of constant iterative process. It never stops. Our Marxist colleagues in China used to call this permanent revolution. And I think that's a very good phrase. That's what you're in. Uh, and, and the more you participate in it, the better. And my old mentor when I was uh, a young student was uh, Professor Sir Michael Howard. And he came up, I think, with one of the most insightful, if there's such a word, um, comments about this sort of thing like that. I am tempted, he said, to declare dogmatically wh whatever doctrine the armed forces are working on now, they have it wrong. I'm also tempted to declare that it doesn't matter. What does matter is their capacity to get it right quickly when the moment arrives. And no truer word has ever been said. And really, what we're talking about then is the difference between classical music and jazz. Um, when you play jazz, you're extemporizing as it goes. And that's what we're in, frankly. And that's what you're in. And that's what you have to be good at if you're not good at it already. And an essential part of that activity is, as I'm just repeating the points made by uh, my colleagues here, is to keep thinking. Never take an answer as a final one, because it isn't. And, and that, after all, is what we're all gathered to do uh, this afternoon. So thanks very much.